Imagine you're out in public, minding your own business, yet you sense something. You look towards whatever you're sensing and catch another person averting their gaze from your direction. This is a small yet common direct experience with cause and effect, also known as karma. Most of us have an inaccurate concept of karma. We think of it as punishment. Yet, everything we give energy to is a cause that creates an effect. Our every thought, word, and action ripples through the dimensions of nature, creating new effects, which in turn create new causes. In this way, any effect is greater than its cause. However, through the fifth arcanum of Tarot, the Hierarch, we can learn how this cosmic principle of karma is negotiable. Five is the number of the Law and of Mars. Five is the Martian energy of Ares, the god of war, whose war is internal and against our psychological vices, errors. The Hierarch symbolizes the five senses, the fifth cycle of cosmic manifestation, the five aspects of the Divine Mother, the five fingers, and perhaps most importantly, the pentagram or five-pointed star famously depicted as Leonardo's Vitruvian Man. Within the fifth card of Tarot, we find the mysterious initiations of our being and demonstrations of the cosmic laws and teachings of universal gnosis, the balanced synthesis of religion, philosophy, science, and art. We are in the age of Aquarius, governed by Archangel Samael, the cosmic intelligence known by many names, including Aries. In this age, we are each faced with a decision, to be or not to be. And all of this is related with karma and the hierarchy. Anubis is the archetype of this arcanum. He is the supreme hierarch, the lord of karma, who, along with his 42 judges of the cosmic law, balances severity with mercy to determine the balance and outcomes of our actions. If we work in meditation to acquire the ability of astral projection, we can visit Anubis in his temple which exists in the astral world. Here we can see our book of deeds, which holds the record of our cosmic debt and credit, also known as karma and dharma. We must understand that karma is a medicine for our soul. This may require a lot of reflection and meditation to comprehend, because like any real medicine, Karma can seem bitter at first. However, if we learn how to consciously experience the bitter shock of karma, we can awaken, we can liberate our consciousness. We can begin to truly see our psychological vices, errors, or egos. What we call fate is the result of our mechanical nature, our psychological vices. Conversely, free will is the result of an unconditioned consciousness without such vices or lunar animal desires. But such free will cannot exist and operate without cause and effect. Without cause and effect or karma, there would be no result, no choice. This would be tyrannical. Instead, we are all free to think as we like, free to choose. However, those choices have results, effects, consequences. That is karma, the law of causality. Unfortunately, our consciousness is almost entirely asleep, trapped within our psychological vices like 
pride and envy, etc. With a sleeping consciousness, many of us protest our karma and justify our actions through identification with one or more of our many psychological vices or errors, egos. When instead, we could consciously live and observe the supreme wisdom of our inner divinity who is giving us medicine to help us awaken that consciousness to greater heights, to greater dimensions. By living our karma mechanically, meaning to unconsciously identify with egoic thoughts and feelings and impulses like anger or self-love, which is pride and often connected to anger, we suffer far more. Much better to learn how to meditate, to learn how to self-observe from moment to moment, which is to learn how to balance the scales seen on this arcanum, the hierarch. To balance the feather and the heart, which Anubis weighs, means to balance the mind and the heart, our thoughts and emotions, symbolized by the feather, which is air, thoughts, and the heart, emotions. When our thoughts and emotions are in balance from moment to moment, and also through meditation, conscious meditation practice, we are far more able to navigate our karma, both in the physical dimension and even more ideally in the astral dimensions. This means to learn about our past lives, to see our egos in lucid dreams, in visual symbols that we can more deeply and intuitively comprehend through the heart. Put more simply, our karma is based on results and not intent. This is why awakening in the physical and the astral is so important. Even a virtue can cause suffering if misused. To illustrate this, imagine that a major natural disaster strikes and society becomes desperate causing outlaws to wander the land. What would we say about a man with the virtue of supreme tolerance, who when confronted with the situation of a bandit attempting to murder his family, only preached about such tolerance instead of defending his family with his life? This is an extreme example, but it helps us to comprehend that certainly both we and the lords of karma would judge this misuse of tolerance harshly. It is a virtue out of place. Put in other terms, fire on our stovetop is helpful. Fire on the couch is damaging. Correct action in accordance with the law of karma requires we develop our consciousness, which is not mechanical, which is not rigid. It is free will. And that free will of consciousness, when listening to our inner divinity and our spirit, can then guide us. We may think we understand karma, but our intellectual mind cannot truly grasp the depths of its complexity. For example, we lack the spiritual perception to perceive the past lives of other people. We, the lunar personality, full of errors, are easily confused when a person in this life suffers terribly from the moment of their birth. We lack the spiritual perception to comprehend intuitively with clairvoyance and consciousness how such a person may have committed many errors in previous lives and is now experiencing the resulting karma to help them awaken. Only a fully awakened and Christified consciousness can determine another's karma. Such a being is a hierarch, like Anubis. The word hierarch in Greek comes from hieros, meaning holy or sacred, and the word arc reminds us of the word arcanum, the cosmic law or principles. This is where we get words like arcana, archangel, and arch magi. These words refer to beings whose consciousness is both enlightened and liberated completely, and who know the tarot in depth. Five also relates to our five senses. In the last video on the Emperor, we discussed how Daleth means door. All five of our senses are like doors. 
When we experience anything through any combination of our five senses, we receive psychic impressions. If we experience these impressions unconsciously, they create psychic aggregates or egos or psychological errors within us. For example, if we unconsciously look at an attractive person and take in those impressions unconsciously, this will create an error or ego of lust within us. It might also feed an error or ego of lust. If we unconsciously eat our food, this creates gluttony. We might say, but I do not experience lust or gluttony in my physical life. And yet, if one begins to work on seeing their egos in lucid dreams, through lucid dreaming practices and meditation, one can confirm such entities exist within, psychologically, in the inner astral. Once those inner psychic aggregates gain enough energy, they begin to manifest in the physical dimension, whether in this life or in the next life. However, if we learn to consciously observe these impressions, we can transform them. This technique requires we practice maintaining our awareness which I discuss in the video about the line of presence. We should also steadily combine this practice with meditation so that both practices, the line of presence and meditation become deeper and stronger with time. Another method of transforming impressions is to imagine a flaming red triangle between the eyebrows at the root or base of your nose. This technique is from the author of Beginning in the Middle which I will provide a link to in the description. Of importance to note with this technique is that it will vary in effectiveness depending on how awakened your consciousness is in the physical, which will itself depend on the consistency of your daily practice in meditation, transmutation, and the sacred mantras, and it will depend on how rigorously, how disciplined you are with the line of presence practice from that video. To fully awaken, we need to work towards always remembering our being. This is known as self-remembering, but we also need to combine this to balance this with observation. Observe our environment and the impressions that are moving through the environment into our being. And the being is represented in Kabbalah, whose aspects we have been discussing in this video series on tarot and Kabbalah, because the two, tarot and Kabbalah, are inextricably connected, related. And ultimately, the best way to transform impressions is through constant awareness that I'm discussing here, constant observation of the inner three brains and the exterior world. This is what the flaming red triangle helps us to achieve. And in many ways, this is how ego death, as explained in this previous video, operates as well, as a moment-to-moment -moment awareness practice which is also like the key of Saul practice in a certain uh, sense as well. Really, these practices all synthesize together over time through patience and diligence. All these practices are how we follow the principle of the magician, which is to descend in order to ascend, meaning to observe and comprehend the elements of our psychological, of our psychology, of our vices, our errors. By doing this, Without egoic judgment, we begin to consciously live out our karma and comprehend it and thus dissolve it without resisting it, without running away from it, or without fighting it necessarily in the way you, you would consider fighting another person or an opponent. The most powerful form of fighting is to divert energy, it's judo, judo of the psychology. And all of this is how we can eventually become a hierarch which is an upright pentagram. There is much confusion about this image of the pentagram. It is a symbol of divinity, of the universal Christ in the flesh, the fire within our body that we could incarnate and carry up our spine into our brain and heart. Furthermore, the upright pentagram symbolizes a true human who has the inner Christ incarnated. There are many paintings by initiates who depicted Jesus or Christ holding his hand in the sign of a pentagram, with the ring and pinky finger pointing down and the thumb 
middle and index finger pointing up, representing the inferior and superior vertices of the pentagram. This is how the five fingers relate to the fifth arcanum and the five-pointed star, which is the pentagram. The pentagram represents the human being made into the image of divinity. It also represents an initiate on the path of awakening consciousness and dying to their egos, their psychological vices, represented in Christianity as bearing one's cross. Consciousness is fundamental. It is part of the macrocosmos and us, the microcosmos. So if we, the microcosmos, awaken consciousness, dissolve our egos, and raise the universal fire of Christ up our spine, we ascend and become an upright pentagram, a true human whose spirit or innermost has dominion over the elements, the four elements of our inner psychology, our inner mechanical nature. For a quick review, to become a true human, one must eliminate all their psychological vices or egos and build the solar bodies. This is achieved through the three factors of Gnosis and especially alchemy or white tantra, which is sacred sex between husband and wife without the orgasm. These three factors and an emphasis on direct experience through meditation and awakening outside the physical body are contained in a veiled form within many spiritual teachings, such as alchemy, Buddhism, the Tao, Christianity, Islam, Egypt, etc. It wasn't until this age of Aquarius that such teachings were made public by Samael Anveor, author of many books like Tarot and Kabbalah, upon which this video series is based. For more details, watch the Eternal Tarot and Kabbalah playlist on this channel where we cover a lot of these aspects in, in the previous videos. So internally, we are currently not an upright pentagram. We are an inverted pentagram. An inverted pentagram represents a fallen human being whose consciousness is trapped and guided by elements like pride, lust, anger, fear, and other psychological errors, other variations. If we combat this inner nature through observation and self-remembering, meaning the judo, right, the judo of psychology, then we can enter the path of initiation of reuniting with our being and spirit. The upright pentagram is used by anyone who seeks to serve humanity impersonally and obey their innermost or spirit, uh, their intuition, silent voice of their being. This type of person is also known as a white magician, and as Manly P. Hall says, black magic is not a fundamental art, it is the misuse of an art. Therefore, it has no symbols of its own. It merely takes the emblematic figures of white magic and by inverting and reversing them signifies that it is left-handed or black magic. So the inverted pentagram is used by those who do not eliminate their ego while also awakening consciousness and become guided by those egos, those legions of psychic aggregates. Uh, these are also known as black magicians who seek to manipulate or to control other people. There are many symbols uh, of both the upright and inverted pentagrams. Of course, Leonardo da Vinci, who was a Gnostic, represented the five-pointed microcosmic star as his Vitruvian man. The inverted pentagram is famously known as the male goat of Mendes, which represents sorcery, black magic, and evil will. And if you see the symbol of the inverted pentagram in the astral or in the physical, be very careful. Meanwhile, the upright pentagram is the symbol of the, the white brotherhood or the, uh, the great white astral lodge, the white lodge, which, of which men and women are uh, a part of. So that, of course, is a much better symbol to encounter in the astral, particularly if you visit a Gnostic church and learn from very enlightened and liberated, elevated beings there. So what we want to become is the upright pentagram, the person who is working to ascend back up the tree of life, the Kabbalah. This is what the Gnostic Gospel of Sophia represents allegorically. She, Sophia, represents the sphere of Geburah, our feminine consciousness or soul, who as part of our monad, 
has fallen into materiality, egos of desire, and the lower dense dimensions of Malkut, the dimension of physicality. She, our feminine soul, aspires to return to the light, to Pleroma, the upper trinity in Kabbalah, and ultimately the absolute, which represents the unmanifested light of pure joy and happiness beyond intellectual comprehension. However, to do this, our divine feminine soul, Sophia, must learn how to answer to Anubis and the hierarchs, the lord and agents of the law of karma. This answering of karma is achieved through awakening consciousness and eliminating our psychological vices or egos, as we've been studying in this video. And there are levels to this. It could be as simple as someone cutting us off while we're driving a car and we notice an ego of anger and frustration arising within us because we are in awareness, we are self-remembering the being, and we in that moment petition our Divine Mother to dissolve it. Or you could be doing profound meditation to the point of Samadhi where you go beyond the physical body and you see something from your being that reveals something very deep and profound about your inner psychological errors and then you pray to the Divine Mother, Divine Mother Kundalini, and you ask for her to dissolve that ego that you've comprehended through deep, profound meditation. Really, both are essential in a synthesized form. You will make far more progress using them together because ego death in motion means you are constantly self-remembering, constantly observing. And of course, to meditate is to deepen that moment-to-moment -moment practice of ego death, of awakening consciousness, and of most importantly transforming impressions to reduce and eventually fully stop the creation of new egos, right? We don't want more egos as we're trying to dissolve pre-existing egos. Let's look at the symbolism of the pentagram. At the top of the head is the symbol and eyes of Jupiter, the father or Keter. As the Egyptian mysteries are synthesized within the Christian mysteries, these are also the eyes of Ra, symbol of Osiris Ra, the solar or Christic power of the Egyptians manifested in Jesus, who was Horus, the son of Osiris and Iris, or Joseph and Mary. The eyes of the Father represent the eternal omniscience of divinity that are always open and see all our thoughts, words, and actions related to karma. The sign of Jupiter relates to the supreme power of Io Patar. Io is the Divine Mother within Greek mythology, and Patar is the cubic stone, the power of what we call Yasad in Kabbalah, the foundation, the vital body. We see the letter A, which is Alpha, and then the last letter of the Greek alphabet Omega. That alpha represents, at one level, our throat and mouth, which is the verb or word principle of creation. Uh, alpha also represents our brain, and our sexual organ is omega. This is the energy of divinity and of kundalini that we carry in our sexual glands and that we must rise up the spine of the caduceus of mercury, mercury representing the mind, brain, and of course represented as the spine of the pentagram. These wings of our spirituality open based on how we use our creative energy. We must learn to conserve that energy, to transform it upwards and inwards, depicted by the positioning of the Omega symbol, which is upwards and inwards. If we look closely at the Caduceus, we can see there are actually three serpents. The central serpent is the staff or spinal column, known amongst Hindus as Shashumna. This is where the healing serpent, Kundalini, rises through alchemy or white tantra. The two entwining serpents are Ida, the lunar serpent, and Pingala, the solar serpent, who are also represented as Adam and Eve or sun and moon. Furthermore, we see the symbols for sun and moon on the pentagram. The moon strides the Hebrew word pehat, which means awe, reverence. The moon is a symbol of our lunar psychology or egotism that we need to learn to dissolve. 
Then we can learn to shine with the sun, represented with the word kafar. In this context, pahad means awe or reverential fear, and kafar means expiation, to pay, to cleanse, to purify. We do need to learn how to purify our lunar psychology, our deeds, our karma, because all of this is connected. And that reverential fear is not an egotistic fear, but one of intense awareness and reverence of how we use the energies of Yasad, our sexual force, our creative force related with the moon as we've been exploring in this series. We learn to be careful with our creative energy. We learn to know how to use it and give it to our divinity within and to conserve and transform it so that it can become a sun. By transforming that energy into a sun, in that process, we are working with kafar, expiation. We are cleansing and purifying ourselves of our psychological errors or vices, defects. To dive deeper into the pentagram, the chalice can symbolize both the intellectual brain and the feminine sexual organ. The staff can symbolize the spinal column, and the sword can symbolize the male phallus. If a husband and wife are working with all of these symbols, these elements in an alchemical matrimony by conserving their creative energy and not spilling the cup through the orgasm, that chalice can represent the mind that receives the blood of Christ, the universal energy of Christ in the blood, in the body, through transmutation. This divine and sacred sex is the sacrament of Roma, which spelled backwards is amore, love. The opening of the Zohar explains how the rose is a symbol of Israel. Israel is a symbol of the different parts of the soul, not the Middle East, but Isis, Ra, and El. So the power of Isis, Ra, and the Hebrew word for God, El, our spirit, is Israel. One part of the Zohar also describes a rose as having five petals, explaining how the chalice relates to the pentagram. The Zohar says, These five are called salvation. They are five gates or doors. Concerning this mystery, it is written, I raised the cup of salvation. This is the cup of blessing, which should rest on five fingers and no more, like the rose sitting at five sturdy leaves or petals. Paradigm of the five fingers, or you can say pentagram. The rose is the cup of blessing. So, by learning to work consciously in a matrimony, a person, a husband and wife, can transform their body, mind, and heart into an upright pentagram, thus purifying their psyche. The six-pointed star, the Key of Solomon, is a profound symbol of tremendous magical power, able to help us seal a home and protect it from negative forces. It represents, in one part, the union or sacred matrimony of the universal masculine force and feminine force. In fact, this was discussed in the Lemuria and Atlantis video if you are interested in that topic. And of course, the tarot which came through Egypt originated with Atlantis, so there is a connection of importance there. Written along the circumference of the pentagram is the symbol of the word, the name of tetragrammaton. Tetra means four, gram means letter or word, and ton symbolizes force and power manifested within a true human being, esoterically speaking. The symbol of Mars is on the hands of the pentagram, and the hands are a symbol of action, how we behave in life, which is governed by Mars, by the law, because of what we do is what we will receive, right? This is the law of causality, of karma. On the feet is the symbol of Saturn, the symbol of death, because a human being who is spiritually walking on their two feet learns how to navigate life, which is the world of angels and demons, while dying psychologically within, purifying psychological vices, errors, through conscious observation without egoic judgment, while remembering the being. This, of course, takes time and practice. 
These psychological defects also exist below our feet in the inferior dimensions, esoterically symbolized as klepoth, hell, and many other names in other teachings and traditions. However, who is the one who has fallen? In relation to Kabbalah, we are Tifereth, our human will, human consciousness. Above is Geburah, related to the fifth Arcanum. She is our divine soul, our divine consciousness, Sophia. In the Arthurian legends, Geburah is depicted as Guinevere. Has said, our spirit is King Arthur, and we, Tifereth, are Lancelot, the warrior who must fight for the redemption of his lady, our divine feminine consciousness or soul. We, Tifereth, the human soul, descend or emanate through these lower dimensions, which are each contained within us. So with each new life or incarnation, we simultaneously move through and exist within Netzach, the mind, Had, the emotions, Yasad, our creative energies, and finally Malkut, our physical body. Tifereth is a vehicle with the potential to manifest the will of divinity, or his or her own personal will. When we, Tifereth, manifest the will of divinity perfectly, this is known as a Bodhisattva, someone such as a Buddha, a Muhammad, a Jesus. So now we have an idea of how to balance our karma, to negotiate karma, to return to the light. This is how we balance our scales, our book of deeds. We learn to listen to our intuition, which is the silent voice right, of our being, our innermost being as well, which is has said, but also our whole being, our Gebera, our Guinevere, this is further discussed in a previous video on the channel. Uh, another important aspect is learning how to practice psychological ego death, also covered in depth in another video on the channel. I will provide links to all the videos mentioned uh, in the description below. But what these two practices, well, what these various practices amount to at a simple level is just to learn how to obey our intuition and to change psychologically from moment to moment in a gradual way that creates an unshakable foundation within us that then we can build upon as we progress from moment to moment spiritually. It has above, so below. If you awaken in the physical more and more, you will awaken inevitably in the astral. Have lucid dreams, eventually astral projection experiences. So don't give up. Uh, finally, the Hebrew letter He represents the womb the feminine yoni. The sacred name of Yad Hava or Jehovah, which is Yad He Vav He, as we discussed in the previous video, represents the man, the woman, the phallus, and the uterus. However, that He is the womb in which our spirituality is conceived, both in the material and spiritual, in Malkut and the higher dimensions. This letter He, with its three lines, can represent the three superior bodies uh, of those higher dimensions that need to become the solar astral, solar mental, and solar causal bodies. Perhaps more profoundly is how the letter He can symbolize the womb of the Divine Mother Kundalini, in which every initiate is gestated and born. The Bhagavad Gita states, in chapter 14, verse 4, the great Prakriti is my womb, speaks Krishna or Christ, in which I place the seed. Thence, O Bharata, Arjuna, human soul, Tifereth, is the birth of all beings. Whatever forms are produced, O Kantreya, in any womb whatsoever, the Prakriti, Divine Mother Kundalini, is their womb, and I am the seed-giving Father Christ. So we can see how this is a symbol of how in a matrimony, yad He, man and woman, work with Vav and He through spiritual purity to connect and properly use that power of creation to create the solar bodies or vehicles, the Merkaba, which has become so popularized today. 
There is plenty more to study and meditate on with the Hierarch, as with any Arcanum in the Tarot. If you'd like to learn more, I've included links in the description. And if you'd like to discuss more and learn more day to day and support the channel, you can join the Discord, which uh, can be done through the link to Patreon in the description. There's also a YouTube membership, which gives the same thing. Your support is deeply appreciated. Thank you to Veronique and Natasha for your recent support on Patreon. And thank you to Yagulai for your recent support on YouTube membership. And also thank you to everyone who leaves a like, subscribes, and leaves a comment as well. That's, that's helpful. Most appreciated. Uh, until next time, may you find inner happiness, joy, and peace on your path of liberating and awakening consciousness.